Goompa, loompa, doompa dee doo. I've got another podcast for you. Goompa, loompa, doompa da da. This episode of the story behind comes been around for quite a long while. Freshening your breath and wiping your smile. It is a favorite of astronaut crews. But when a pain went stuck on your shoes, the way that, the way that, the way that, the way that toilet paper does. Goompa, loompa, doopa, gee, da. I hope you like random trivia. You will learn all about this goo, like the Goompa. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind chewing gum. But first, a quick message. What is the Potter family? Hey, this is Shane. That's not Shane. That's a robot set by the government. And that's Kenny from I'm now. I'm a robot I'm, too. From now that I'm older. More like now that I'm robots. This is Gabriel Russo from the Hollywood Scandals of Yesteryear podcast. This is Steve from the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is Nick from the Epic Film Guys podcast. This is Emily from The Story Behind. This is Adam from Everyone Has a Podcast. This is Sean Harrigan from the Cinescape podcast. We are you. Podcasters coming together in a community to help one another grow. So follow us on Twitter at Potter Family and use the hashtag Potter Family in your tweets and retweet other people who do the same. Potter and Family, where great podcasts come home. Humans learn from birth to suck with their mouths. It's a way of getting food and also a self-soothing mechanism, which is why pacifiers are popular with babies. The act of chewing comes later when solids are introduced. And as far back as 9,000 years ago, having something to chew has been a pastime for humans. Back then, Northern Europeans chewed birch bark tar for fun, and also to relieve toothaches. Ancient Greeks chewed mastiche, which comes from the resin of the mastic tree. But it was the Mayan and Aztec cultures that laid the groundwork for what we know today as chewing gum. They chewed what was known as chicle, which came from the sapodilla tree. But there were certain social rules regarding the chewing of it, like only kids and single women could chew it in public, while others had to chew it secretly or privately for the purpose of cleaning their teeth. When the settlers came to North America, they adopted the practice of chewing spruce tree resin from the Indians, and in the mid-19th century, the first spruce tree gum factory was constructed in Portland, Maine, by John Curtis after observing loggers chewing it. This is considered the first commercially marketed chaw, But if you can imagine what spruce tree resin tastes like, you probably guessed it wasn't that great. On top of that, the demand for paper, also coming from the spruce tree, was too great to leave a steady supply of resin, and Curtis began experimenting with other ingredients for his gum. You may know the name General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana for his victory at the Battle of the Alamo in 1836. But when he was forced to retire on Staten Island, he brought with him his love of chicle and imported the substance. When introduced to inventor Thomas Adams, Santa Ana and Adams attempted to create a rubber substitute from the material. The rubber business in America at the time was extremely lucrative, and Adams and Santa Ana made several attempts and spent an exorbitant amount of money only to fail. But Adams had another idea. He was the first to add flavorings and sweeteners to the resin to produce what he called rubber chewing gum. And if you already made the connection with the word chicle and the popular chewing gum brand Chicklets, Adam's name still appears on the packaging. Adams, always the inventor, also figured out a great way to market his product in 1871 without the use of hiring salesmen. He patented a machine to dispense his stick gum on New York City train platforms and this became the early predecessor to the gumball machine as we know it. By that time, Adams found competition in the gum market, most notably William Wrigley Jr. Wrigley was born to a soap salesman and began peddling the Wrigley's scouring soap at an early age through his teenage years. 
According to the Wrigley website, and I kid you not about the wording, he left Philadelphia for Chicago with just $32 and a dream. When he arrived in Chicago, he began selling the soap, but marketed it to merchants with a premium gift of baking powder. But that premium ended up being more popular than the soap itself. So Wrigley changed his business from soap selling to baking powder selling. He repeated his sales technique of giving away a premium with purchase, but this time it was chewing gum. Again, the premium became more sought after than the original product he was selling. So he switched again and began selling Wrigley's Juicy Fruit in 1893. Adams Gum Company still dominated the gum market by the end of the century, merging the six largest chewing gum manufacturers. But Wrigley was able to up his marketing game with tactics such as sending packs of gum to every United States citizen listed in the phone book and also sending gum to children on their second birthdays. If you remember from the story behind peanut butter, it was soldiers in World War II who combined peanut butter and jelly from their rations and popularized the combination. Wrigley convinced the U.S. Army to include his chewing gum in rations, and it became so popular, chicle became harder and more expensive to use, so scientists were tasked with creating a synthetic version. Because of the demand by American soldiers, chewing gum became associated with the West, prompting Leon Trotsky to conclude one of his speeches with... One final prophecy. In the third year of Soviet rule in America, you will no longer chew gum. Needless to say, that hasn't happened. Not only has gum transcended international borders, it's also been sent into space. In 1964, NASA even sent Trident sugarless gum aboard the Gemini, which was used by astronauts to clean their teeth in between meals. And Trident still prides itself as being the brand of choice for pantries aboard the space shuttles probably much to the chagrin of that fifth dentist who won't give in and recommend sugarless gum to their patients. The role of Leon Trotsky was played by Chris Nessie from the House of Ed Tech podcast, and my Gloompa Loompas were played by Craig from the Ultra podcast. Tune in Thursday for the second in this two-part series about gum, the story behind bubble gum. Information for this episode was sourced from history.com, chewinggumfacts.com, NPR, and more links, which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. Follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at storybehindpod, or subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.